what's up and welcome back if you're new here i'm liz and i'm your host here at crimes untold yes if i look like a disheveled mess it's because i am because i just got out of work anywho today we're going to be talking about charlie chopoff if you don't know who charlie chopoff is it is another unidentified serial killer um well they're pretty sure they know exactly who it is but um they are deemed mentally unstable so but I'll get into that in a little bit. So, Charlie Chopoff is a pseudonym that was given to a killer in which a string of crimes that involves the murder of three African-American children and one Puerto Rican child and also one child that is unnamed. I'll get into that as well. That occurred between 1972 and 1973 in Manhattan, New York. There is also another attempted murder of an unidentified child or an unnamed child, like I just mentioned, uh, that is also attached to this case. So each of these murders involves genital mutilation or the attempt of the act on the victims and all of these children or all of these victims were male and children. So if that makes you squeamish, I highly recommend you click out of this video. Um, if your discretion is advised for this one because it is it's pretty gruesome. So, to this day, there is one person that is suspected and even confessed, but the case is still open. And, like I mentioned, I'll touch base on the suspect and on that in a little bit. So, our we're going to go through all of our victims and then I'm kind of going to talk about our suspect, what I think, all of that jazz. You know, the normal shebang here. So, victim number one is Douglas Owens. He is the age of eight. So he was found stabbed to death by 38 stab wounds and his penis had been cut but not severed from his body. This was an extremely furious attack and his body would be found on the roof of 222 East 121st Street in a pool of blood and this was on the 9th of March of 1972. His shoes were missing also, which is kind of weird. So they took this genital mutilation and the severity of it. When they saw this, they were at first like, what the fuck is going on? There's also evidence to indicate that there was indeed a sexual assault that had taken place before, prior to the genital mutilation. And this mutilation was so tragic to the point that there was literally only a flap of skin that was still attached from him to his penis. So after this attack, we would have, uh, after this murder, we would have the attack of our unnamed youth. This happened on April 20th of 1972. So just a month later, a month and a few days later. So this unnamed boy was repeatedly stabbed over his body and his, his genitals indeed would be severed from his body. But he did survive this attack and he was viciously attacked on this rainy day after having been sodomized as well. Now, his parts weren't just severed, they were hacked off and they would eventually find his parts in a park where children were playing with the remnants of his genitals. Unfortunately, yes. So... This boy remains unnamed to this day, but he was able to give a description of his attacker. So that's one positive about this. So he said that his attacker was in his late 30s, either Italian or Hispanic because of his complexion. He might have had a limp or walked with a limp. He was thin and he had dark hair. He also had two distinct features that really stood out to this boy. He had an unusual black marking on the left side of his face and specifically like the left side of his chin. So like around here and he had a mole on the left hand side of his face as well. So it was two distinct marks on the left side of his face that this boy remembered. So this would come in handy when it would come time to try and piece together for the police to piece together who this was. So our next victim would be murdered in October of 1972. This would be Wendell Hubbard. So he was age nine and he was found dead on the roof of an East Harlem tenement building in which he lived in on the 23rd of October of 1972. And this was on 2013 Fifth Ave. This location was just six blocks from where our first victim had died. 
So it's very close in proximity to where all of this is taking place. So Wendell was stabbed a total of 17 times. He was stabbed in his chest, his abdomen, and in his neck. And his penis had indeed been severed from his body. And it was taken from the scene and has never been found or never recovered, unfortunately. Our next murder would take place the following year. So on the 6th of March of 1973, nine-year-old Louis Ortiz would be murdered just like that of Douglas Owens. Now, what I mean by that is mutilation and the stab wounds, just like Wendell Hubbard. So Lewis was going to the corner bodega to buy some bread and milk, and his body would be found in a stairwell of a basement on 200 West 106th Street. <sighs> Street names in New York are so weird. But so at first there was some extreme doubt when it came to his killing and how it would be related to the other two that they found. But similarities would be with the genital mutilation and the stab in this the stabbing that he had so he was found stabbed to death by 38 wounds and his penis was severed from his body and this was literally the same mo as the other two murders in attack so the other thing that kind of deterred the police from it too is that lewis is puerto rican and the the MO kind of changed. So it's believed that he was taken because of his dark complexion, but they were still skeptical because he wasn't of the same race. Ugh, I hate when the race card comes up because then they're just like, no, that's not a related crime. But clearly, MO, the modus operandi is the same. So for me, there's no doubt that he's a part of the Charlie Chop Off attacks because of the, the stabbing and the genital mutilation. But as we find out with our next victim, which would take place in August of 1973, his name is Stephen Cropper, and he was eight. His death is very different from the other three murders in attack. It's really weird. So Stephen Cropper, um, he was found on the roof of a tenement block building, and this was on the Lower East Side. But... There was no mutilation, and he had died from a slash mark to an artery on his arm. He, he bled out, and this slash mark was made with a razor blade. The only thing that kind of sexualized this attack is the way he was posed. He was posed in a very kind of like sexual derogatory way. He was found by a woman that was just walking her dog on the 17th of August of 1973. And the last time Stephen was seen was an hour before his body was found. And that was at 5.30 p.m. on that evening. Yeah. So kind of, I'm kind of going to give you a run through. We've, our, we've met all of our victims and our unnamed victim. Now I'm kind of going to give you a run through of everything. So about two weeks after the murder of Douglas Owens, there was a tip that came in that would talk about the identity of the killer. And it this tip gave that the killer was Erno Soto. So this tip came in on March 26th. Soto is known for suffering from severe, like, he had several different mental issues and it's possible that he had a mental breakdown and he was committed multiple times to the Manhattan State Hospital and was well known to be there for his uncontrollable violence as well as everything else that basically was going on with him. There was a lot that was going on and he was known to be there. This tip would go ignored unfortunately and on April 20th 1972 there was another attack. So Tip ignored, another attack. Well, shit. So a lot has been said about Charlie Chopoff due to his gratification of lust killing or thrill of sexual mutilation, kind of post-sodomy in most of these attacks, or fully having a torture moment in which he is able to completely degrade his victim by taking the sexual organs and basically humili humiliating them in the process of doing so. His choice of victim also is very interesting as well. So typically speaking, the type of victim is one that you're, the killer is drawn to. 
And I say this because it has something to do with a distinct part of their past or something about them helps hinder something they're trying to suppress. That's the most generalized explanation I can give you as to why somebody chooses a victim they choose. So like killers that have a specific woman type, sometimes it's mommy issues that help drive that. Yes. So in the case of Charlie Chopoff's type is a younger male victim that are either black or Hispanic or of a minority that might not have been watched or seen when they were taken. So it was easier for him to take them because they were younger. So it's possible maybe something happened to him when he was younger. Maybe something. There is more There is more to a serial killer than just their type. They're like ba basically their entire MO in their style of the way that they do the things they do. There's more to them. And I'm not, I'm not giving any serial killer a handout, but most of the time, mostly speaking, most of these people have a, there's a distinct reason as to why they do what they do. Just like this dude, I'm pretty sure he was either sodomized or something happened to him sexually, some type of sexual torture that made him in a way feel like, Ooh, I don't know why, but it gets me excited and it could have been the age he was. And then after committing such crime on a young child, then generally speaking, probably feels disgusted with whomever he is using and then wants to humiliate them by chopping off their appendage and turning them into a girl. I'll kind of get into like a little bit more, but... Sorry about my rant. So after the murder of Stephen Cropper, there was witnesses that came forward and reported seeing a man that had a limp and was running from the building in which Stephen Cropper was found. And this man had a striking resemblance to the Charlie Chopoff sketch that was made with the help of our unnamed victim. So victim number two. So after the murder of Stephen Cropper, there's no more murders. Charlie Chopoff simply just goes quiet. He's not there. That's until... August 20th, 1973. So there's another man that's kind of, they question him, but they don't believe it's him. So Daniel Olivo was arrested after assaulting a five-year-old boy in the park of the Bronx. And this was in the Morrisania section. So he is said to have fit the description of Charlie Chopoff that was given by Stephen Cropper, like from, so given by the unnamed boy, but helped with the Stephen Cropper case. Um, so, Olivo was thin, Hispanic, he had a pockmarked face, and he suffered from a limp. But even with all the relevant details that seemed to go hand in hand, he was dismissed due to his alibi during all the killings. So, due to this, there's a lull in the investigation. But our initial suspect, Soto, would come back into play. He was arrested for attempting to abduct a young Hispanic boy on May 15th of 1974. So this boy screamed, and he was screaming when he was running away from Soto. Soto then quickly kind of like, he was kind of citizen arrest. There was like a citizen arrest. So citizens just, you know, were holding him until police came, basically. And he was surrounded by the neighbors. Soto was in charge with the kidnapping, and immediately suspicion was back on to him as being Charlie Chopoff. So when he was sent to Bellevue to be observed, he admitted to killing Cropper and even went into explaining why he did so. Kind of what something I said earlier will make more sense now. So he said that God told him he needed to turn some little boys into girls, and he went on to explain it was a grand mission from God. So the psychiatrist that was observing him said that he was violent due to his religion delusions and Soto would be diagnosed with schizophrenia after this observation. So there was also a psychologist for the police at the time. His name is Harvey Schlossberg. He said that Charlie Chopoff was a lust killer and his killings are basically a orgasm symbolically. So 
he would also go on to say that Charlie Chopoff is probably afraid of women, hates himself because he's a homosexual, or he has homosexual feelings and tendencies. These feelings enrage him to the point that disgust takes over after committing such crimes that he feels he feels the need to castrate them, thus turning them into girls. So he hates himself, but then commits a homosexual act, then feels the need to humiliate them by castrating them. This kind of goes hand in hand with what I said earlier, right? So the psychologist would then go on to say that the two killings in, in a year, at the same time in a year, could also be of a significance, but we don't know. So ultimately, Soto would be indicted for the murder of Stephen Cropper, and he was found not guilty due to mental disease or defect. And he was permanently committed to a state institution due to being basically a walking time bomb of anger and rage. So during his trial, it would also come to light that during the time of the murders and attacks, he was committed to the hospital just three days after the murder of Owens, admitted to the hospital after the attack of the unnamed boy, and he would be readmitted to the hospital after the murders of Hubbard and Ortiz. So he had basically was like a flight risk for this hospital. Now, due to the wishy-washiness of this case, the string of murders has never been solved and remains open to this day. Although it is believed that Soto is still in a high security institution and it is unlikely that he will ever be released. So that, my friends, is the Charlie Chopoff case. I know, short, sweet, to the point. Sorry about the grotesque, but I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, you guys.